from my prison <clears throat> the timing from my prison cell I watched them play the cool game just a man a blindfold and a purple robe of shame they struck the man upon his face and said in mockery prophesy and tell us wasn't either him or me then they brought him to my cell and said man don't you know Ravis, you're the people's choice. He'll die, you're free to go. Later, as I watched them take his life on Calvary, I told myself a thousand times it was either him or me. Either him or me. He took my place on Calvary. So unworthy to be free, but it was either him or me. They're inside sin's prison walls, bound with chains so strong, awaiting death the wages for which I had worked so long, and knowing hell awaited me in eternity. The warden said there was no hope for either him or me. Then I stumbled by the prison window where I saw a wounded man upon a cross who died for one and all. I knew that somehow through his death that I could be set free. That's when I put my faith in him. It was either him or me. Either him or me. took my place on Calvary. I'm so unworthy to be free. But it was either him or me. He took my place on Calvary. But it was either him or me. Once my dreams were shattered and all that mattered was gone on the winds of sorrow. Everything I had planned swept out of my hand and I saw no hope for tomorrow. With my heart near to breaking, I cry, Lord, I can't make it by myself. I just can't carry on. And with the storm at its darkest came his word, I'll never leave you. You are love, let my strength be your own. And it takes a storm now and then. To remind me to depend, to depend upon the Lord, and to rest in His word. For in the wind and the rain, 
I learned to call on his name. And I thank him in my soul. It took a storm to make me strong. When my feet are stumbling and my hopes are crumbling, the Lord is there abiding. He is peace, He is calm in the midst of the storm. The Lord is there abiding. He is grace, He is power. He is strength for each hour. He is comfort and safety from all harm. There's joy in my soul, for the Lord has control, and beneath are His everlasting arms. It takes a storm now and then. To remind me to depend, to depend upon the Lord, and to rest in His Word. For in the wind and the rain, I learn to call on his name and I thank him in my soul it took a storm to make me strong yes I thank him in my soul it took a storm to make me strong it took a storm to make me strong. Well, ain't that the truth? We don't like those storms, but they sure are needful, helpful, and necessary in our lives. You know, take a storm to make you strong. So I, I'm, I'm in a hurry this morning. Certainly, I'm not trying to excite anything, but the Spirit's different in here this morning. And maybe, maybe the Lord spoke to your heart today, and you, maybe you have something, you're, a testimony, or something you would like to say, or don't ever want to take that away from you. Amen. You sure have. the Lord. What a blessing. This family's been through the storm and through the fire. What a blessing to be able to praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Amen. Somebody else? Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. What a blessing. Amen. Somebody else? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Amen. Somebody else? All right, I'm, I'm not going to beg you. I'm going to preach. Somebody else have something they want to say? Amen. Amen.
he's old. Say the Lord, the Lord's been a constant companion. He's certainly been a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Amen. Yes, sir. That's right. Love you too, brother. Love you too, brother Mark. Amen. Somebody else? Yes, sir, brother Frank. Amen. Praise the Lord, Brother Frank. Thank you, Brother. Amen. Somebody else? All right. I gave you an opportunity. You'll be the one going home defeated, and all of us will have missed a blessing. But the Lord's good all the time. All right, you children that are seven and under can make your way to Children's Church at this time. Children seven and under can make your way to Children's Church. Sad. Oh, the ground is 
Thank y'all very much. Appreciate that this morning. Well, this past week, Thursday and Friday, we had the privilege of preaching in a tent revival in Lebanon, Virginia. And the cold and the wind and the rain ugh, really did a number on our sinuses and our, our throat. Nonetheless, we had a we had a great time. I certainly do appreciate your prayers praying for us. As we had the opportunity to preach there, I preached for well over an hour both both nights, and I won't I will not do that to you this morning. <clears throat> but um, I do want to preach something that I at least start preaching something I didn't even get finished on on Friday. As long as I preached, I skipped the majority of the sermon. Well, not the majority, but at least a very good portion of the sermon. But uh, I think it was about twenty people, children and adults, went with us on Friday. We had a great time. And so I, will, I won't apologize, but I will tell you this. I'm going to preach some of the very same things that I preached on Friday night. And I pray the Lord to help us. Something that I think we can have renewed in our lives or reminded in our lives that the Lord is coming. And uh, I, I remember when I was younger, it seemed like almost, or maybe it was just because I hadn't made preparations and it seemed like it was more often, but it seemed like every single week you heard somebody preach on or mention the fact that Jesus is coming. And seemingly we've gotten away from that. But I'll tell you this, Jesus is coming. And the importance of preaching on that is that is our blessed hope. It is our, it is our strength as those of us as believers. And if you're not saved, I remember being lost and the preacher preaching on the fact that Jesus was coming. And it certainly scared me to death because I knew that my mom and dad was saved and they were going to be gone. And I, I was going to be in all kind of a mess without them. And so I hope the Lord will help us today. I want to mention some things. Turn to Titus chapter 2, if you will. Titus chapter 2. I want to preach on the blessed hope or what you and I will recognize as the rapture. <clears throat> and I will not even get anywhere started good in the sermon this morning. I may finish it sometime later. I don't know. But whether I do or not, Jesus is still coming. I'll tell you that. Titus chapter 2, I'm going to read uh, verses 11 through 14. We'll pray together and ask the Lord to help us. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2, verse number 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in church this morning. Thank you for the good Sunday school hour. Thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for the sweet spirit of God that has met with us and been with us this morning. We're grateful for that. I pray you would help us now, Lord, for the next few moments to preach. I pray you would help us to preach with power and with love and with understanding and with kindness. Help us, Lord, to say things that are needful and necessary. And please help us to refrain from saying anything that would be contrary to the truth of your word. And Lord, we'll certainly thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the topic, as I've already mentioned, that I want to preach on today is the blessed hope. This is the future of the church. This is the first stage of Christ's coming for his bride. It is referred to by many as the rapture of the church. Even though the word rapture is not mentioned in the Bible, the truth concerning the rapture is certainly taught in the scripture. The rapture is the fact that Jesus will come for believers and move, remove them from this earth. The Bible, in speaking of the blessed hope here in Titus chapter 2 and verse number 13, uh, and speaking of the blessed hope, a good Bible definition for hope is found in Philippians chapter 1 
and verse number 20, where Paul said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. So a biblical hope is an earnest expectation based on the truth of Scripture or upon the truth of the Word of God. When you and I think about hope, we uh, tend to uh, use the word in our vernacular as more of a wishful thinking. But this blessed hope that we're speaking about is a biblical hope. It is an earnest expectation that God is going to do exactly what he said he would do, and that is he is going to come for his bride, the church. What a blessed day that will be. Now, we may mention the fact that it is a blessed hope. The word blessed means happy or enjoying special happiness and, and the favor of God. It means to be worthy of adoration. So this is certainly a blessed hope for those of us who know the Lord as our Savior. This event, this rapture will be something that takes place suddenly. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 52 that it will be as a moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Believers, both dead and alive, are going to leave the ground. The, those in the grave are going to come forth out of the grave. Those of us who are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with the Lord to meet Him in the air. It is, it is certainly a blessed hope that we're looking forward to. Now, remember the verses that we read here in verse number 11 through verse 14 in Titus chapter 2. Brother Oliver Green said about these verses, he said to him, these verses compass some of the greatest passages of Scripture in the Bible, and I agree with him. I agree with him for several reasons. We see in these verses, we see first of all, the grace of God that saves us. Then we see the grace of God that schools us. And then ultimately we see the grace of God that will one day separate us. These verses show our redemption, our reformation, and our rewards. We can see from these verses of Scripture the threefold nature of of our salvation in these verses of well as well we see the grace of God hath appeared that is that is past it is teaching us in this present world that is present and we are looking for the blessed hope that is future so in effect I am saved I have eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ by having my sins forgiven and I, I, I have become a child of God I'm an heir and a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ I am saved I am currently saved from the eternal penalty of sin. I am daily, I am daily being saved. I am daily learning to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, according to verse number 12. And so I am being saved from the power of sin. I've been saved already from the eternal penalty of sin. I am daily being saved from the, uh, from the present, in this present world, from the uh, uh, power of sin, and one of these days I am going to ultimately be saved from the very presence of sin when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to get us, and I'm looking forward to that day. Now, let's look at these verses. Verse number 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. We are saved by grace, and apart from grace there is no salvation. You say, preacher, that's elementary. We already know that. Yeah, but we, you can't, you can't just leave that because we read it. The Bible said the grace of God that bringeth salvation. So the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation does not come about by sincere living. You don't, you don't get saved because you join a church. You don't get saved because you turn over a new leaf. You don't get saved because you start doing a few good works. You don't get saved by sincere living. You don't get saved by giving. You don't get saved by water baptism. You get saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't get saved by praying. You don't get saved by begging. You don't get saved by abstaining. The grace of God brings salvation to the heart of every believer. You say, I can't believe it's that simple. Then that's why you're not saved. You're trying to work your way to God, good your way to God. The Lord Jesus Christ wants you to put your faith in your trust in what He has already done. And your faith, the grace of God, will save you by grace through faith. Now, let's look at the whole verse. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I, I understand there's a lot of people who do not believe this simple, plain Bible truth. Salvation, the grace of God, has appeared to all men. 
I like to take every opportunity I can to punch Calvinism in the nose. And the Bible is very clear in this verse of Scripture that the grace of God hath appeared to all men. And immediately the uh, people began to ask this question and that question and say this and say that. I want to tell you this. The Bible tells us that the grace of God hath appeared to all men. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to be able to explain it. I don't have to be able to teach you exactly what it is, although I believe I can from Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I think I can explain it to you. But I'll tell you this. Whether you can explain it, whether you can teach it, doesn't make any difference. It's true. It's God's responsibility that the whole world get the gospel and understand the grace of God. It's our responsibility as individuals to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ but the Bible said the grace of God hath appeared to all men God has made it his responsibility for individuals to know their need for a savior now the Bible said the grace of God hath appeared to all men teaching us what is it teaching us it's teaching us that there's no such thing as limited atonement it's teaching us that there's no such thing as hyper Calvinism it's teaching us that there's no such thing thing as extreme predestination it's teaching us that there's no such thing it's fatalism or whatever it is that they're calling it today. Here's what I want to tell you. It's teaching us that you're not predestinated to be saved and you're not predestinated to be lost. You're not elected to be saved and you're not elected to be lost. The grace of God hath appeared to all men and whoever will put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved by the grace of God. Some Bible denier will say, well, everyone hasn't or doesn't have or hasn't have or will not have the gospel. I tell you again, God has made it His responsibility to make sure that the grace of God appears to every man. I believe that. Amen. Now, verse number 12, look what the Bible says. Teaching us, so the same grace of God that saves us also teaches us. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. So this verse proves to us that God not only, not only does the grace of God save us, the grace of God also teaches us. In fact, the same grace that saved us teaches us Christian living. First of all, the grace of God teaches us the negative side of the Christian living and what we should avoid. The Bible mentions two things here, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. So there's two things that you and I should deny. We should deny ungodliness. Look, if you will, turn backwards just a couple of pages to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, we have a command. That command is this, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You say, that's the preacher's job. That's the teacher's job. It is, but it's also your job, amen, uh, to study the Bible. It's not just the preacher's responsibility to study the Bible. It's not just the teacher's responsibility to study the Bible. It is your responsibility as a believer to study the Bible. And so there is a command. Listen, God is not going to excuse ignorance. And so there's a command to study the Bible that we need a workman that neither not be ashamed, rightly dividing the truth. There's part two to that command in verse 16. He said, but shun, that, that word, it means to stay away from. It means to avoid. And so it says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, we're talking about denying ungodliness. Now, we have an example in verse 17. It says, And their word will eat as doth a canker. So he's talking about false doctrine. We'll mention that some more in just a moment. And so false doctrine is like a cancer eating at the soul. And he said, And their word will eat as doth a canker, as of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. And so we see here that this, this Hymenaeus and Philetus, they were teaching a false doctrine that the, the resurrection was past already. And so the example that we have in the Bible here, I think it is most amazing. The example that we have in this passage of Scripture for ungodliness is not adultery. It's not drunkenness. It's not drug addicts. It's not fornication. It's not though all of those things are definitely ungodly, but it is the fact that someone is taking heed 
to a false doctrine. And so listen, any teaching or if you're following is ungodliness, is teaching or following a teaching that is contrary to biblical truth. And the same God that saved you will guide you into all truth. Ain't that a blessing? And so deny ungodliness. Then it says deny worldly lust. Now, you and 2 Timothy come forward just a few pages to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We deny ungodliness and we deny worldly lust. James chapter 4 and verse number 4. Look what the Bible says. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enemy with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This doesn't mean that you can't be friendly to someone who is lost. It means that you should des- to deny, it means that you should deny the same desires or the same attitudes or the same habits or the same forms of entertainment, the same way of thinking, the same way of acting as the worldly crowd does. It does listen, you, you can't be a witness to someone if you can't be a, a friend of them. You can't show your, the Bible says if a man has friends, he must show himself friendly. If you're if you wondering why you don't have any friends, there's your answer. You, you're going to have to be friendly to people if you want to have some friends. And so it's saying don't act like the world. Don't become partakers of worldly things. Don't get involved in worldly lust and desires and entertainment. And, and so we are to deny worldly lust. Listen, I, I have a fear for this crowd who says that they're saved and they have never denied any worldly lust. Look what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, you're in James, just keep going a little bit. 1 John chapter 2, and look at verse number 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Listen, listen. The spirit is is weak. The spirit is is a, uh, the flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen. And so we must be willing to follow the spirit. Now, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The, the flesh had rather do anything than serve the Lord. The, the flesh had rather get involved in anything but being faithful to the service of God and the work of God. Now. It says, for, the, the, for, the, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So, Lord, help me to please deny worldly Love. So, first of all, the grace of God teaches us some things that we should deny. Now, come back to our text in, in Titus chapter 2. Secondly, the grace of God teaches us the positive side of Christian living or what we should do. Look at the verse again, verse number 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, then it says we should. This is what we should do. Live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And so we should live soberly. You say, preacher, what does all this have to do with looking for the blessed hope? Well, you can't just pluck a verse of Scripture out of context. you got to read it in the context of the passage, and the Bible is telling us some things. First of all, you have, you have no hope of a blessed hope at all if you're not saved. And so verse number 11 uh, talks about salvation. You have no desire for the blessed hope at all if you're living wickedly and ungodly as a believer. That's verse number 12. And so first of all, you got to be saved. Second of all, you're going to have to be living in such a way that's pleasing to God before number 3, verse 13, you're actually looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. And so this part of teaching us to live pleasing to God is teaching us to deny some things, ungodliness and worldly lust. I hope you're denying ungodliness. I hope you're denying false teaching. I hope you're, de- listen, we're, we're living in a time when false doctrine is rampant. Now, it's not that it's any more widespread than it's ever been. It's more available than it's ever been. I, I talk to people all the time, and, and they're all mixed up on all kinds of things. I'm not being critical. I want to help everybody I can. And I find out I don't have to talk to them for very long till I find out how come or why they're so mixed up. 
They've started watching this person on YouTube and they started listening to this guy on YouTube and they started listening to this guy on YouTube and they, they listen, there's a lot of that stuff available but you better be careful what you listen to or you're going to hear some things that go contrary to what thus saith the Lord. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to, uh, to understand the truth of God's word and be willing to obey and follow what thus saith the Lord and not what man has to say. And so it is teaching us to deny ungodliness. That is things that are contrary to the truth of God's word. And then it is teaching us to deny worldliness. Listen, if you're saved, there ought to be some worldly lust that you have denied. And it teaches us to live soberly. That's where we are. We should live soberly. This means we should exercise due restraint on our passions and practices of daily living. Now, we should not only be sober in uh, not not only in absence from alcohol, obviously we should we should definitely, if you're a believer, you should be abstaining from from all appearances of evil, and that would certainly include partaking of of alcohol and drugs and that kind of stuff. But it has to do with more than that: your appetites, your passions, anything that would draw us away from godliness and right living. We ought to be sober towards. We ought to we ought to restrain our appetite from anything that leads us away from God and the word of God. We are, we are to live lives that enable us to invite others to follow us as we follow Christ. Now, I, I'm not asking anybody to follow me. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we ought to be living our lives in such a way that others can see that we are an example of the Lord Jesus Christ and they could follow us because we are following Christ. Now, Paul taught the Ephesians this in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. He said, and be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I understand when we come to this passage of Scripture, we normally major on the sin of drunkenness, and maybe we should, but we should not at the same time neglect the sin of being filled with the Spirit. I'll tell you why. Every time, every time the early church, in the book of Acts particularly, every time they got filled with the Spirit, they went somewhere and told someone about Jesus Christ. Now, we, we are living in a time when people get this idea or this thinking that if someone is filled with the Spirit, then they are, they are uh, running the aisles and they're shouting and walking the back of the pews and, and uh, talking like chainsaws and all kinds of stuff such as that. And, but listen, in the Bible, when people get filled with the Spirit, they go tell somebody about Jesus. And so I, I can safely say today that there's not a lot of Spirit-filled Christians. You know how I know that? There's not a lot of people telling other people about Jesus. And so the Bible said, be not drunk with wine, where is in excess? There's a lot of people who are taking liberties with drinking. There's a lot of excess in drinking, but there's not a lot of excess in people being filled with the Spirit. Now, so we should live soberly. Then, then back in our text, verse Titus chapter 2, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. Then it says, righteously. So we should live soberly. We should also live righteously. Now, Brother Green, Oliver Green, he said this. He said that soberly is our duty to ourselves. That, that's, that's a good statement. And righteously is our duty to our fellow man. And so soberly, we are restraining ourselves from worldly lust and worldly appetites, and that's good for us. Righteously is the way that we're living before men. That is good for others. That is our duty before mankind. I, I think we can prove this from the Bible. The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34. The Bible says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So our, our work and service both to God and man is currently in view here in this passage of Scripture. Listen, the world is on its way to hell in large part because God's people are not awake to righteousness. I think there's, I think there's a lot of, lot of folk, at least in the circles that, that I know and, and believers that I fellowship with cont uh, on a continual basis. There are a large number of them who are living soberly. There's a lot of things that they're not taking an excess in because of the, uh, they understand what that would do to their lives and their testimony, but they're not living righteously. Because if they were living righteously, they would be sharing the Lord Jesus Christ with others. 
Amen. So we should not only live soberly, we should live righteously. Now, back in our text verse, Titus chapter 2, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. We should be growing in our Christian lives. We should be growing in our Christian lives to the point where we are godly, to the point where we live and act like Christ, where our lives resemble Him. Uh, that, that is what it means to be a Christian. It means to be Christ-like. And Christ is, is caring. He's loving. He's compassionate. He's, uh, obviously, he, he is a God of wrath and a, and a, and a just God and, and all of these things. And so we need to live godly. We need to live our lives, grow in our Christian life so that we are godly. Now, in this same passage of Scripture, chapter 2, verse number 12, in this present world, we're to do this now. Listen, we, we're not waiting to live a life that is pleasing to God. You ought to be living that life now. I ought to be living that kind of life now. And then, and then there's another thing at the end of verse number 14. We should be zealous of good works. Look at verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So zealous means eager. It means enthusiastic. It means forever, passionate, and warm. And so one of the signs that we are looking for the blessed hope is that we are zealous of good works. Now, we read, we read those surrounding verses. We made mention of some things in verse 11, verse number 12, and then zealous of good works in verse 14. Now look at our text verse, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. Look, this is what will keep you going. This is what will keep you witnessing. This is what will keep you working. This is what to keep you laboring. This is what to keep you serving. Look, if you're looking around at your fellow man, you're discouraged. If you're, if you're, you, you know, I, I wonder where so and so is. I wonder why they're not here anymore. I wonder why they do this. I wonder why somebody else has done that. Listen, you, you, you got all this wondering going on. Why aren't you looking to Jesus? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. If you're looking unto Jesus instead of looking around, you're going to have a lot better, there's going to be a lot better possibility that you're going to be witnessing. There's going to be a lot better possibility that you're going to be working, that you're going to be serving, and that you're going to be laboring. We're not looking around at others who, who may or may not be serving. We're not looking down at others who may or may not be saved. We're looking to Jesus. Amen. We're looking to the Lord. He is, he is the author and the finisher of our hope. We are looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, nothing else, nothing else compares to the encouragement to go the extra mile like looking for that blessed hope. Now, in reference to the turn, return of the Lord, as we're mentioning here in verse number 13, it talks about looking. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 6, the Bible says to watch and be sober. Talking about the return of the Lord. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 7, the Bible says, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That passage is also speaking about the return of the Lord. So here's what we're admonished to do concerning the blessed hope. We are to be looking, we are to be watching, and we are to be waiting for His return. A lot of people are looking, watching, and waiting for a lot of things but it's certainly not the return of the Lord. Amen. Now, I want to look at a couple of passages of Scripture. I understand it's 12 o'clock already, and I, I haven't even gotten to the message, but I, I want to look at a couple of passages of Scripture. Come to Hebrews chapter 10 for just a moment. I want to look at a couple of passages of Scripture that may not be usually or normally thought of concerning the rapture, but they're definitely relevant. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Look what the Bible says in verse 25. You say, preacher, how in the world is our assembling got anything to do with the Lord coming? Well, just we'll just read the verse. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more. Now look at this last phrase. As you see the day approaching. So th this would indicate to me that the closer we get to the Lord's return, the more people are going to be dropping out. And those of us who have not dropped out need to be getting together more often than we have been and more often than we already do. Now, so some, some wonder, I, I've got people ask this question, and it's a reasonable question. Some wonder how can we see the day approaching if Christ's return from the, for the church 
uh, the rapture does not involve signs? Well, I, I believe the Apostle Paul answers that question for us, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But listen, the fact that people are people you thought would never be out of church are out of church. People you thought would never, you, you never had any idea that they would drop out, they've dropped out. People that used to be one time faithful, they were here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they'll be here when everybody else is gone, they're gone. Listen, you, you can sit around and wonder why and cry, and, I, and I'm not saying you shouldn't be uh, concerned and worried, but I'll tell you this, if you're looking at that instead of looking at Jesus or looking for him to return, then you're going to find yourself in a muddled up mess. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be defeated. You're going to be downtrodden. You're not, there's not going to be any rejoicing. There's not going to be any joy. There's not going to be any satisfaction. Listen, I think God wants us to be a happy people. We're the only people in the world that have anything to be happy about. We're, we're the only people that have anything to rejoice about and some of you need to let your face in on the fact that God wants us to be happy amen we, we got a lot to be happy about we got a lot to rejoice about we're going to heaven and it could be today amen the Lord could come and get us before we leave this building you say preacher we've heard all that before yeah and one of these days you're going to hear it and you're going to find out that it's true because it's going to happen amen he, he could come at any time now so the, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we need to be assembling. And we need to be assembling even more so as we see the day approaching. Now come to 1 Timothy. Come to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll keep you up to date on the time so you won't have to be looking at your watch, okay? It's five minutes after 12. Actually, it's four minutes after 12. Now, we're talking about this this this. How, how can one see the day approaching if the return of Christ from the church does not involve any signs? Let me, let me say this. The visible, the visible indication of the return of Christ for His church is seen only in the spiritual condition of men's hearts. I, I, I want to say that again. The visible indication of the return of Christ for His church is seen only in the spiritual condition of men's hearts. It is seen in the... It, it, it is seen in the, it's not seen in some outward heavenly manifestation. Look what the Bible says here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. In other words, the Spirit speaks in direct terms. It speaks plainly that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith. And so look, Paul told Timothy, Paul told Timothy right here in verse number 1. I was telling my wife, uh, this morning, I was doing some studying last week, and, and man, right, right here's something that'll help you. It, it, it helped me. I hope it helps you. Uh, Paul told Timothy in this passage of Scripture, he said the Spirit, not me, Paul, not me, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is speaking expressly, and it's giving you a strict heads up. The, the Spirit of God says, I'm serving notice right now, Timothy, that some shall depart from the faith, not if. Not if they do, some shall depart from the faith. So if that's true, and it is, then Timothy can't stop it. Some are going to depart from the faith. And, and there's nothing that we can do to stop it. There's nothing we can do to keep it from happening. Look, we, we can't keep a church from going bad. We can't keep denominations from going bad. We can't prevent families from going bad. We can't prevent individuals from going bad. If they are inclined and seduced to go that way, there's nothing that we can do to stop it. What you need to make sure of is that it's not you that is departing from the faith. Amen. Because some shall depart from the faith. I believe the Bible, don't you? All right, it says some shall depart from the faith. Read the verse again, verse four, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Here's what they'll be doing. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So instead of heeding the Spirit of God and obeying the Word of God, some folks are seduced into following the doctors of man that are supplied by devils. Now the word seduce means to be led away from that which is true. It means to corrupt. Some are being led away from the truth. They're being corrupted. Verse number two says, this, this will be the evidence of it, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So these men who are teaching these false doctrines, who are seducing people away from the things of God, they have no remorse concerning what they do because their spirit has been seared with a hot iron. 
Verse number three. Now, I, I think this is amazing. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, I think that the example the Lord chose to illustrate his point with is very eye-opening. We're talking about some departing from the faith. They're giving heed to seducing spirits and their and doctrines of devils. And the thing that God uses here as an example is forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. You and I, we would, I guess, in a, maybe my mind, I don't know how your mind thinks, but in my mind, I, I would be thinking that the Spirit would be trying to seduce folks to drugs, alcohol, gambling, inappropriate relationships, or something like that. However, the example listed here is forbidding to marry and abstaining from meat. Now, we understand that there are religious uh, entities, Catholics, Episcopal, some others, who are forbidding to marry. We understand that. And uh, they, they've been preaching and practicing that for hundreds of years. Now, According to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you don't want to get married, don't get married. But to command against getting married is a doctrine of devils. In fact, the Bible, in fact, God performed the very first wedding in the Bible when he took a rib from Adam and he made Eve and they were joined together as one. The very first miracle we have recorded of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible, he performed that miracle at a wedding. And so God instituted marriage and God definitely is in favor of marriage. All the uh, leadership responsibilities of the church, the bishop and the elders, they are required to be the husband of one wife. God is in favor of marriage. Now, the same is true with eating meat. I'm going to come back to this marriage thing in just a moment. The same is true with eating meat. If you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. Now, uh, and if you want to eat meat, give, give God thanks for the meat and, and eat it. Amen. That's, that's what the Bible teaches us. But if you go around teaching that you are more spiritual because you eat meat, that is a doctrine of devils. Or if you go around condemning someone else because they do eat meat, that is a doctrine of devils. That is something that is brought on by seducing spirit. I don't, I, we don't have any issue with that that I'm aware of at all. I, now, this statement com, concerning forbidden of marriage, you say, I, I don't see how either one of these things have to do with us and the day that we live in. Well, we're living in a time when our society is discouraging marriage. Many folks... Many folks are living together and shacking up and enjoying marriage benefits without the commitment. And God is definitely against that lifestyle. Adultery and fornication are an abomination in the sight of God, just like homosexuality is an abomination in the sight of God. People get, you know, and, and I, I'm all, I, I agree. I'm, I, I am completely against this whole uh, agenda that's going on in our day of this, this LGBT and all of this um, same-sex marriage and, and all. And listen, it's wicked. It's ungodly. But I'll tell you, the Bible, the Bible says the same thing about adultery and fornication as it does that lifestyle. It says it's an abomination. And we're, we're living in a nation that is absolutely discouraging marriage. Now, you say, preacher, what does that have to do anything? I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. And one of the proofs that Jesus is coming is that the world is discouraging marriage. And, and it's becoming more and more rampant everywhere that, you know, just, just shack up, just live together. There's no need to make a commitment. There, there's no need. Listen, I want to tell you right now, in God's eyes, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. You better get married if you're going to involve yourself in that kind of lifestyle. Now, I, I want to give you some, some quick facts concerning marriage and, and cohabiting. Now, this is from 2017, and some of the, some of the information is even before then, so I, I'm sure that the, uh, the stats are even different now than they are, were when this was compiled. In 2017, there are two divorces registered every minute in the United States. You, you don't think our country is not against marriage? Here, here, here are seven facts about cohabitation. If an 18-year-old chose to wait until the age of 23 to, either, to get married, they would cut their chances of divorce in half. Over the past five decades, cohabitation has increased by almost 900%. 
in 2012, consensus information shows that there were 7.8 million couples that were living together in the U.S. without getting married, which was more than 5 million couples, which was 5 million couples more than the 1996 data showed. A 2007, now this is 2007, this was a long time ago. A 2007 survey showed that only 27% of Americans disapproved of cohabitation before marriage. I'm sure that that number is even less now than it was then. You say, why is this important, preacher? Proof that marriage is being made light of and discouraged is proof that the Lord is coming. Amen. Now, on average, when encompassing data from over four decades of study on cohabitation, it is estimated that those who get married after living together face a 33% greater risk of divorce than couples who choose biblical marriage and abstinence. More than 60%, here's number six, more than 60% of Americans, now this was in 2017, see cohabitation as one of the first steps toward marriage instead of an alternative to it. 65% of couples who get married every year live together at some point before the marriage occurs. God is in favor of marriage. And the fact that the world that we live in hates marriage and is discouraging marriage and is discouraging the traditional family um, that the Bible has set forth is just further proof that the Lord is coming. I'm not that old. I remember when if people lived together in sin, they'd done everything that they could to hide it. Now they flaunt it and brag about it and boast about it and make light of it. Now, look what the Bible says in Romans chapter 13. What does the Bible say? It's, it's, uh, it's 16 minutes or 15 minutes after 12, okay? <clears throat> Never forget, Zeno Gross. I used, to, I used to hear him preach. He's in heaven now. I, he would say that. He'd be preaching. He'd say, I'll keep up with the time so you won't have to. And he, he would tell the time. But Romans chapter 13, verse 13, look what the Bible says. Let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Now, chambering is, is wanton. It's lewd and modest behavior. It is the Bible word for cohabitation or shacking up. The Bible refers to it as chambering. Now, this is mentioned. The number 13 in the Bible is the number for rebellion. And we're in Romans chapter 13 and verse number 13. And so fornication is still wrong. Adultery is still wrong. And if you don't understand those words, sex before marriage is wrong. Amen. You, you would think you got one amen out of a, out of a fundamental, independent, Bible-believing Baptist church. It's still wrong. Amen. Now, so the Lord's coming, amen. It's a sign of His return. Now, there's, there's other things. I, I'm, I'm just going to have to stop, and I know I wasn't going to get anywhere near being done this morning. I want to tell you something. Jesus is coming, and we ought to be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact, the truth that, that He's coming, the fact that we know He's coming is men's hearts are against God. I'm not talking about just lost people. I'm talking about people who may be saved or people who profess to be saved. They, they love themselves. They're covetous. They have no desire for the things of God. They, they live wickedly and ungodly. Their churches, churches are full of people who are living in all kind of outward sin, known sin, and have no remorse about it whatsoever. And the church don't even, uh, con they, it seems that the church promotes it instead of condone it. All of those things are just proof that Jesus is coming. And he could be coming today. And I say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We, are in, we are in great need of the help of the Lord. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm not going to, it's in First Timothy chapter, or Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul said that um, <clears throat> perilous times shall come. Uh, what was it? This is the true saying. And, uh, no, that's Second Timothy. Let me, let me read the verse to you. I'm not going to read all of it to you. I'll go through it sometime. This know also that in the last days, I can't remember how it started. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And then he goes through a whole list of things down through there that tell us we, listen, we're, we're in the last days and the perilous times are here. 
And the Lord could be coming at any moment. And I say, come on. Amen. I'll get Keisha to come to the piano for just a moment this morning. And I'll let her play or sing whatever she'd like to do. With heads bowed and eyes closed for just a few moments. Lord spoke to your heart this morning. Maybe you'd like to come. Maybe you're here and you're not saved. You've never been saved. Today would be a great day to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. The Bible says today is the day of salvation, and now is the accepted time. If you'd like to come this morning. Else want to come today? We're going to pray in just a moment. Be dismissed. If you're not saved, today would be a good day to get saved. If you are saved, but your heart's grown cold towards the idea that Jesus is coming, He is coming. He's coming. Father, thank you for the Bible the opportunity, Lord, to be here today. Thank you for folks who have come to be with us on this Sunday morning. It's a blessing to be able to gather together, sing together, testify and preach, hear the good things of the Lord. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to have been here. Pray you continue to speak to hearts from your word. Lord, for all that you do, we'll not fail to thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much for coming and being with us this morning. I hope you'll be back this afternoon, our afternoon service at 